We are in a series of messages from the gospel according to John, and uh, this is the third sermon, and we're in the first chapter. We will pick up steam as we go along and uh, cover a little more territory than that, but uh, today we're focused in, and uh, Lisa introduced this very well during the children's sermon, we're focusing in on John the baptizer, John the Baptist. Now, to uh, set the table for this, and I told you I'm going to be sharing lots of stories in this series, my favorite stories, and I'll get to that here in just a moment. The prophet Daniel had an interaction with a king, a prominent king historically of Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar uh, thought quite highly of himself, and Daniel warned him about pride. But this is what the Bible says. He was looking out one day over all his achievements, the incredible architectural wonders of his capital, the ancient city of Babylon, all he had done. And, and the Bible records it this way. He declared, this is Nebuchadnezzar declared, is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory? And the Bible says that uh, God struck him. Uh, the Bible tells us, you know, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And that doesn't appear just once in the Bible, but multiple times. God opposes the proud. You don't want to be on the opposite side of God. When God starts opposing you, you're going to be in big trouble. Well, God's opposing him. And he goes, he goes from the mighty, exalted king of Babylon that in a moment, he's, he's, uh, he just goes nuts. And he's out eating grass like an animal, living like an animal. God God's good at humbling those who are filled with pride. Herod Agrippa I was bringing a persecution upon the early church. Uh, like a lot of members of the Herodian family, his relatives opposed God and the things of God. In Acts chapter 12, Luke tells us that uh, Herod, Herod Agrippa I, he was in a trade dispute with a couple of key trade cities, uh, Tyre and Sidon. And he went to straighten this out, and he goes in and he delivers a speech, and this is how it's described in Acts 12. Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. How about that? Uh, God does not play games with his glory. Then there's a little letter. Now, this is John, the apostle, that writes the gospel according to John. Also, three short letters in the New Testament are attributed to him. We call them 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. In 3 John, and I trust you shall not ask me what chapter, because there's only one chapter in 3 John. 3 John John's talking about a conflict that's arisen with, with this certain guy who's just causing problems in the church, and his name is Diotrephes, and here's his problem. He's described, this is a great way to remember, be remembered forever in God's Word. Diotrephes likes to put himself first. He likes to put himself first. He's a head table, front of the line, not a servant heart by any stretch. He's a, he's a prideful heart. He always wants things to be all about him. Okay. Now I'll tell you a story about me. This is a good many years ago now. Some of you have heard this story in uh, some smaller groups, but I don't think I've done it here. So several years ago, there was a church here in the area, and they were about to dedicate a new worship center. And uh, they had a Saturday service for this big dedication service. There were lots of things going on. It was a really inspirational time they planned out. But... In the process of that, they invited me and then someone from yet another denomination to come and speak at the dedication service on Saturday night before they would launch with this new facility on Sunday. And this was with great controversy because the church had never had anyone from outside of their denomination speak in their church. 
So the pastor was stepping way out on faith to, to even attempt this. And then, uh, and then they, didn't, they didn't really, weren't sure how that was going to go. So they built some pretty good guardrails around it. We were each limited to two minutes. So you can only mess up the whole Bible in two minutes just so much. So. Also, we weren't allowed to speak from the pulpit. We had to speak from the ground level floor. They had a podium on the ground level. We weren't going to speak from behind the holy pulpit. So uh, here's the assignment. The other pastor, it's just before Easter that all this is happening. So the other pastor was to talk about the cross of Christ. And I was to talk my two minutes about the resurrection of Christ. And I think they again figured, well, if we're going to give them an assignment, let's give them something really basic. They can't mess up too badly. So we went through the service, lots of great music, several people spoke, church members just celebrating what God had done and giving their testimonies. And then the other pastor, guest pastor, we were both sitting, uh, they had uh, three sections, so we're facing seats right in front. We were both seated right in the middle, close to get to that floor level podium, right in the middle of the front row. And the other pastor got up and he walked to the podium for his two minutes to talk about the cross of Christ. And he took seven minutes, and he talked about how wonderful it was for churches to have unity, that he was proud of this church for finally stepping out of their, out of their hideaway uh, sort of existence to join with other churches, and this ecumenical movement he prayed would go forward, and we would work together more and more as churches in the community. He never got to the cross in his seven minutes, and then he sat down to a cold reception. They sang another song, and then it was my turn. They introduced me, uh, pastor of First Baptist Church Allen, and I came around. I stood behind the podium. Now, if you can't speak with great enthusiasm about the resurrection of Christ for at least two minutes, you probably shouldn't be in business, right? Well, I kept it right at two minutes, and I didn't talk about anything but the risen Christ and how wonderful and glorious and how it set Christians apart from every other religion in the world. And it was one of those, by the way, people have said since then, I've told this story, maybe all your sermons should be two minutes. <laughs> maybe that's your sweet spot. You go three and you've stepped outside of what you're capable of. But I hit my two minutes and it was, it was something that I carefully planned and it was easy in two minutes to build and build so that when I got to the end of my two minutes... It was, bam, I hit, I hit it at the end of the two minutes at the high point of the talk. This has never happened before. You, you folks have never given it to me. <laughs> they all stood up, and I got a standing ovation for my two-minute sermon. They stood up and applauded. And so, I did what any Baptist preacher would do in another denomination when that happens. I just dropped my mic. Walked around, and now the other pastor, he, he departed the building after this was over. And I, I just went to, he had other things to do, or they chased him out, I don't know. But I went back to the same spot I'd come from, front row, in the middle. Everybody's standing. They said, hey, just remain standing. We're going to sing this first the, a song about the risen Christ. And they belted it out, and it was, it was wonderful. The music was great in this church. And I was singing the top of my lungs, and it was a great moment. And I, and I was thinking, man, you know, God, thank you for that. And then I was thinking, because I really nailed that. It's not often, you know, you just, you just, you're hitting on all cylinders at the right time, the right moment. Bam! And we were, we were rocking it. I thought, you know, I wonder if anybody will be at their church for their opening. Or if they'll all say, I'm going to First Baptist Church. If that's what the, that guy, boy, he, he, can, he can do it. And they, they just empty, empty them out. They'd all come hear me. So I continue to think about this. And you can do all this while you're singing a song. It's a familiar song, so I'm still singing my song. My front row, just belting out with the rest of them. But I'm thinking about that. And then they went into a second song. And, and I'm still singing. And, you know, my shoulder's sore because I dislocated my, my shoulder, uh, pat myself on the back. And singing that second song, we got about halfway through the second song, and some of you have been in a social situation before where in the room, it's like, 
something shifted. Like there's a disturbance in the force. Something's different than it was. And so I, I'm still singing. And I just casually looked over my shoulder. There's not another person on the floor sit, uh, standing. I'm the only person in the building still standing up. I have, with no signal from the platform, everybody just sat down. Except for the guy in the middle who can't see because the first two rows were empty. So there's no peripheral vision. I had to turn all the way around to realize I'm the only person in the building still standing up. So I just slowly, hoping that I could just melt into the cushion, (laughs) sat down on my front row seat and... uh, the still small voice of God came to me. And I, I remember it vividly in that moment. As God said, Chad, just as a reminder to you, you don't have sense enough to sit or stand at the right time apart from me. And I just want to remind you of something else in this moment. <laughs> and it, it was a quote that I heard Billy Graham say. Uh, uh, someone told me that, I, I, I was at a, it was a weird meeting I was in with a very prominent person who said he'd been to Billy Graham's birthday party. Oh, okay. You know, I was at Billy's birthday. This is, I was way out of my league. Uh, this guy says, yeah, you know, I was at Billy, Billy's birthday party last month. This is that many years ago. And then I realized he's talking about Billy Graham. Oh, really? Yeah. I must have lost my invitation. And, uh, He told this story, and this quote came from Billy Graham, uh, but uh, it's what came to my mind in that moment from the Lord that God said to me, Chad, just as a reminder, I don't share my glory with anybody. Now, in light of those stories, I want to pick up the story of an amazingly humble, powerful person John the baptizer. Now, we have John's gospel, but John in his gospel tells a story about John the Baptist, John the baptizer, same name, different guy. And I want to pick up that story in John chapter 1 and verse 19. Here's what God's word says. This is the testimony of John. Now we're talking about John the Baptist, John the baptizer. The testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Like, you're out there doing all this stuff. Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Well, then, why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness. This is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, there are a couple things about John the Baptist. This is our focus for today in uh, John's Gospel. A couple of there's things to note about him. Here's the first one. Is that God has a unique plan for John. 
He had a unique plan for my life. He has a unique plan for your life. John the Baptist was a one-of-a-kind character. He's a transitional character in the Bible. We would consider him, between the Old Testament and New Testaments, he bridges the gap, like the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he comes first as the herald, the announcer of the good news, the Messiah has come. God had already told his father his name would be John. He told him he should take the Nazarite vow. He would, he would uh, not cut his hair. He would not drink a part of that, that extreme vow. He was unusual in his dress and diet, and Lisa explained that very well. I, I was disappointed with Lisa today. I'll tell her this because she's here. I'll do it publicly because that's the best way to embarrass Lisa. That uh, there's got to be a pet store somewhere where you can get some locusts, uh, some big grasshoppers to feed pets and things. And I really thought that she would go to the, I mean, go all in. And just all you needed, Lisa, was you just, you just needed one. And I would have let you fry it up first or something, but then just dip it in some water, knock it down before the kids. Just to demonstrate it. Everybody says it tastes like chicken. You would have been fine. But pretty extreme diet. The uh, camel hair outfit. The, the leather belt. Uh, he's really reflecting a whole lot about the prophet Elijah. Because he's described that way. But you think about this guy. He never, he has, he's, he's around 30 years old. Never cut his hair. He just looks like a crazy person. And he comes out of the wilderness. And just explodes onto the scene. And... People flock to him. God set him apart for such a time as this. God had a plan for John's life. And he has a plan that is a detailed plan for every life here. Our God is so awesome. He established that plan long before you were born. And this is why, we, why as, as a Bible teaching people, Bible believing people, we believe that uh, the unborn have to be protected because a verse is like this verse. God said of Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. That God had this incredible plan all laid out for Jeremiah before he was born, while yet in the womb. And, and that's true for everybody here. God, just, God didn't just, oh, well, I didn't see that coming. Didn't, didn't realize who you were going to be. I, I started working on it once you, kept, once you got a little older. God has charted a plan for your life in great detail. For John, yeah, you've heard the expression, I guess, uh, boy, when they made him, they broke the mold. That's true for everybody here. You, you're not one in a million. You're one in around 7.6 billion, and that's just the people on the planet now. Nobody's like you. Nobody has uh, your DNA. Nobody has your fingerprint. God has made you so special at so many different levels. Exactly who he created you to be. And a special plan for your life is wrapped around that. And uh, I can point to some things from God's word that talk about what that plan should involve. But you, get, you need to get to know God because the one who created you is the one who really knows why you were created. God has a plan for your life. Just as he did for John. Second thing. And we'll spend bulk of our time here. With this one and only life that God has entrusted to me, the highest calling that I could ever pursue, the calling that every person who names the name of Christ, that says I'm a Christian, that I'm a believer, every person who's cre she's created to point other people toward Jesus. And that was John's core objective in life. If you're wondering about God's plan for your life, that's a big part of it. Our job, like John's job, is to introduce people to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And John's en entire existence is that. Every opportunity he got, anybody he could get in front of, anyone who would come and hear him and see him, everything, not about, hey, I'm John, I've got a great word for you. He, he's pointing toward Jesus. There's this story, it comes out of the 1800s, and there was a a famous evangelist in that time period, in late 1800s, named Sam Jones. And he had this story that he told, and it's a story that holds up pretty well for today, too. It was about uh, a guy he had met on the Mississippi River. He was working, loading barges, loading steamboats off of a pier on the Mississippi. And this guy had this habit that he'd work and work and work. He's a great 
great guy on the pier, but, and had been there for years. But when this certain steamboat came by, he'd stop whatever he was doing, and he would say, Look, look yonder at the captain of that boat. Do you see him? He's the finest captain on the Mississippi. Well, he'd do it, but only then, and only with that boat, only with that captain. And when there were new people working around him, and he'd stop, shut down everything to make the, look, finest captain on the Mississippi. They'd say, why, why do you say that? Why do you always stop? Why are, you, why are you shutting down to point out that particular boat, that particular captain? And he would smile and say, years ago I was working on his boat. And I fell overboard. And though I've been around the river my whole life, I can't swim a lick. He said, uh, that captain jumped into the river and he rescued me and and with a big smile he'd say ever since he saved me I'm always going to point him out you know what ever since Jesus saved me I've been wanting to point him out Uh, ever since my life was he delivered me from sin death and hell I want to point him out. That, that's what we do as followers of Christ. We point to Jesus with our everything, with our words, with our lives. John the baptizer would say, he's coming. You need to repent. You need to turn away from sin. You need to have a right relationship to God. He's clearing the way. He's, he's charting a path for the Messiah to come. Maybe, maybe we say he has come and he's coming again. Repent, turn from your sin. You need to get to know Jesus. He's come for you. The Bible says, John was, this is how he described himself, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. I thought about that uh, the other night as watching uh, The Tonight Show. Five nights a week, Steve Higgins, the announcer for The Tonight Show, and he starts the show that same way, and now... Here's your host, Jimmy Fallon. Now, Higgins is a character in his own right. He does a lot of comedy bits, and he writes for the show, has a pretty significant role on The Tonight Show. But Steve Higgins' responsibility is to make much of Jimmy Fallon, to point to Jimmy Fallon, to be the first person to laugh at his jokes. It's all about Jimmy Fallon. John the Baptizer came to introduce the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and John's job was to prepare the way of the Lord. Eliminate the obstacles, make it as clear and plain, as accessible as possible. Come to know Jesus. Come to the Savior. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And our responsibility, when you sign on to say, I belong to Jesus Christ, and I'm going to follow him with all my heart for the rest of my life. He is my Savior. He is my Lord then our responsibility is to clear the path between Jesus and anybody and everybody we know who needs to know Jesus. We are to make a path to him. Now, in chapter 3 of John's gospel, chapter 3, verse 30, there's some words. It's a, if you want to memorize a verse this week, this would be a good verse to memorize, mostly because it's short. Verse 30 of chapter 3 of John's gospel says, talking about Jesus, John the baptizer says, he must increase, I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. That is an axiom. It's It's a short, catchy saying with a big eternal truth wrapped around it. The first law of a right relationship to God, of spiritual growth and relationship to God is going to be, I've got to become less in order for him to become more in my life. Humility, humility, humility. Some examples of that. The Apostle Paul was such a prominent character, so well-known, so influential, but he was always pointing to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, there was a controversy. Some people said, well, I like Apollos and how he does stuff. Well, I like Paul and how he does stuff. And Paul says, who's Apollos? Who is Paul? No one. Christ is, is everything. In 2 Corinthians, he says, we're earthen vessels. He said, 
we're up front. You, you see us as leaders and all that, that, which they were leaders. But he said, we're just clay pots while Christ Jesus is the glory of God shining out in this world. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, When I came to you, brothers, uh, I didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Just that message. If we could just get that message out there. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power, so that your faith might not rest in the kingdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul preached Christ. He made much of Christ. He made nothing of himself. Not about Paul. All about Jesus. Now, here's... So, John the baptizer, he's a, he's a pretty popular guy. Amazing character, but so, so humble. But here's what Jesus says about him. This is from Matthew chapter 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Nobody greater. Think about that. Jesus says he's the greatest man who ever lived in the history of the world. Most privileged prophet, most popular preacher. He's bringing the greatest message the world has ever heard, the Messiah that we have prayed for, that we have longed for, that we so desperately need in a broken world. He has come. And the lesson he teaches us is how important it is that we fade away so that Christ can become everything. So here he is. He's a humble spirit. But people, Judea, Jerusalem, they're coming out of the city, out of the villages, out into the wilderness because they just want to hear anything he's got to say about anything. And he is so challenging. And he's rattling the, the structures of society in such a dramatic way. And then Jesus shows up. So multitudes are coming to John the Baptist. Then Jesus shows up. And Jesus has been living in obscurity up in Nazareth for around 30 years. And he finally appears. He's baptized by John. And John says, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And a few of his closest followers, a few of John the Baptist's closest followers, they start following Jesus. And then Jesus gathers up a few more. But for the most part, Jesus is still an obscure character. Nobody knows much about him. Not uh, multitudes flocking out to him. And then you get to chapter 2 of John. And we'll do the first uh, 10 verses or so, 10, 11 verses of chapter 2 next Sunday. And we talk about the first miracle that Jesus performs. Uh, turning water into wine in Cana at a wedding. But that miracle... It's done, but not in a big, dramatic, in front of a whole lot of people. There's some servants who are filling water pots who realize what's happened. And there's a core group of disciples, and it just gives them what they need to keep moving forward in faith. It, it strengthens their belief in who Jesus is. Jesus is still an unknown quantity. But the next story in John chapter 2 is Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And he walks into the temple. And the temple complex is supposed to be a place of worship set aside for the people of God. But here's what's happening. They've turned it into a den of thieves. Uh, a lot of crooked folks, they're, they're exchanging money. They're buying and selling animals for sacrifices, taking advantage of people mostly in that process. And that temple complex just has become a shortcut from Mount of Olives to the Kidron Valley and into town. And so people are just using it as a thoroughfare. And worship is disrupted everywhere. And Jesus comes in and he will have none of it. And he fashions, fashions some cords into a whip and he cleans house on that place. Turning over the tables of the money changers. Okay, he's at the temple in Jerusalem. He's taking on everybody. Now, this is big in public. And all of a sudden, Jesus is not so obscure anymore. He doesn't have a lot of followers yet. But now he's made a public demonstration. Now he's on people's radar. And then from that point, it's casting out demons and performing miracles and teaching with such authority. And the, the miracles give credibility to his teaching. And the teaching points everybody to God in a whole new way, in a dramatic call from, uh, from Jesus' mouth. Come to the Lord. Turn away from sin. 
And now the crowds start to gather and gather and gather. And there are more and more people. And he's attracting more and more attention. And with the miracles and with the teaching, and no one had ever heard anyone speak like Jesus. And then John, he's still, he didn't disappear. Like, oh, Jesus is here. I'm tagging out and I'm done. He's still teaching the people. And point, repent of your sin. The Messiah has come. He's here. Give your life. That, follow that guy. So here's John. He still has his following. But he said, follow that guy. Go after him. Who are you? I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness, getting the road ready for the Messiah to come to town. Follow him. So you have John telling people to go after the Messiah. Jesus is attracting him by his teaching and miracles. And John's, John's star is beginning to fade. And they overlap of necessity. There, there's some transition taking place. John needs to keep pushing everybody Jesus' direction. And the apostle John records in chapter 3 what takes place. There's a debate that pops up toward the end of that chapter. It's between uh, John the Baptist still has people who are close followers of his. They actually stick with him till the day he dies. So he has people who are still around him. They found so much in him that encourages them, challenges them. They're not turning back from him, even with the behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world stuff. And they get into a debate with some Jewish man, it's not unnamed here, about, and, and this guy seems to challenge things like, well, your boss is uh, not what he used to be. Doesn't have quite the crowds he used to have, does he? He's not all that anymore. And well, They're a little jealous for John. Uh, they're hurt that he's not getting all the attention he used to get. and They're feeling, feeling some of that. And... That's just the stage for John the Baptist's reply. <laughs> well, they said, Rabbi, he who is with you, was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. That's probably an overstatement of the facts at that point in the game. John the Baptist teaches such a great lesson in humility. Here's, here's our struggle. We're always competing with Christ for priority in life. I want to be about my will. I want to be about my agenda. I want to set my own calendar. I want to set my own goals. I want it to be about me, right? That's, that's a basic structure of a sinful nature. But, but John, his example is so powerful. because He makes it all about Jesus. That it's about Jesus being out front in all things. It's about Jesus right-sizing what we think is important, downsizing a whole lot of things that just don't need to be a big deal to us that are so consuming for us, making it all about Jesus. And, G and he gives a great illustration. It's, it's a quick note in verse 29. And what John's going to do is he's going to give an illustration that would have related well to the people he's talking to. Uh, culturally, he said, I'm just like the best man at the wedding. That's my job. So let's talk about a wedding in the first century because that best man, a little bit different job than uh, we think about it being. In ancient times, the best man had an important role to play. Uh, in fact, he had the central role. Weddings were big deals. A lot of you, you're some of you are planning a wedding right now. There are weddings uh, out there in the, your recent history or years ago. You remember what it was like. You just work and work and work, and then you have that one day, and then the big day, and then you're done. But these weddings would last for a week. Once you kicked off the festivities, you have a week of stuff to be responsible for. There were all these arrangements to be made that would last not just for a day, but for a week with, with food and with decorations and with celebration and all this stuff wrapped around the wedding. But it wasn't the bride and her family that did all the heavy lifting on that. It was the best man. Okay, how many of you have ever served as best man in somebody's wedding? I want you to raise your hand and keep them lifted for a little bit. There. That explains a lot about why we don't do this anymore. <laughs> we had a lot of people who claimed to be best man, but 
I don't know. I think they were making it up in the first hour. Best man in the wedding. The best man did all the arrangements. And here's how it worked. He did all the arrangements, but he was also the communication liaison between the bride's family and the bride and the groom. Because here's how you knew, this would make some of you obsessive compulsives out there, you know who you are. This would make you crazy planning a wedding. The wedding happened when the groom got the house ready. Now, he was motivated. He wanted to get married. But it's all, we're, we're waiting for him. And so there's a waiting time. You're waiting for the groom to take care of business. And when the house was ready, then it's time for the wedding. So the best man, he's not only planning all this stuff, but he's back and forth communicating to the bride. You know, I think he's getting close. He almost has this finished up. And uh, this will be close. And then when it got to be really close, okay, almost there, almost there, almost there. And then it wasn't the, the father of the bride that gave away the bride. The best man the word that, uh, John, that John the Baptist uses here, the best man would go and get the bride, and he would take her to the bride, bridegroom. So he's the central figure in this whole thing. And it's a great picture of how things work. And John the baptizer says, that's my job. I'm not the bridegroom. I'm the guy making the arrangements, getting everything uh, cleared out, so that I can connect the bride to the bridegroom, so I can connect sinners to the Savior, so that I can introduce lost people to Jesus. And I appreciate, he says to his followers, I appreciate that, you know, you're, you're jealous about um, my stars fading, not what I used to be, crowds aren't what they used to be. Truth is, I couldn't be any more pleased because I know I'm right in the sweet spot of what God's called me to do because this is why I have come to point to Jesus in everything about my life. And when the bridegroom takes his bride in the first century, the best man, he just fades out of sight. Not even a footnote to the story. And that brings us to John 3 verse 30. He must increase, I must decrease. Just like the best man, he becomes less, and the groom becomes more. How do you get your life in order? How do you get your life right size when you're having to make so many choices about this is important, this is not important, this matters, this really isn't that big of a deal? Well, right sizing comes by understanding, okay, this is who I am, and this is who God is. And that establishes some priority. And until we get to that, we're going to be struggling in life. John said, yeah, after me comes one more powerful than I, uh, the, even the, the, the straps of his sandals. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie them. Jesus said, this is the greatest guy who's ever lived. And yet he says, compared to Christ, the, the lowliest servant in the household is who uh, untied the straps on the master's sandals at the end of a, a dirty day. It was a lowly job. And he said, I'm not even worthy of that when it comes to comparing me to Jesus. In 2013, 2013, the Oxford Dictionary, Dictionary made selfie their official word of the year. Uh, the very fact that the word selfie is a part of our vocabulary says a lot about our culture. In Greek mythology, there was a, a Greek god uh, called Narcissus. You remember Narcissus? He, he, he looks down, and there's, a, there's some water, and he sees his reflection in the water, and he said, that is one good-looking guy. And he falls in love with himself. He's the first selfie guy. John the Baptist, I picture him, he's just not a guy who would ever take a selfie for any, for any reason at all. One, one person said that the toughest instrument, musical instrument to play is in life is second fiddle. John was comfortable in the role of playing second fiddle. He made much of Jesus, less of himself. Like John, could, could, you, could you take some steps maybe to just to make, make Jesus a bigger deal, make him greater in your life, more prominent, more important, more priority? And here's how it works. The only way Jesus can become greater in your life is not because you just add more layers to you. The only way Jesus becomes greater in your life is you 
and your agenda and your plans and your priorities become lesser so that he might become more and more. I want you to repeat after me. <laughs> yeah, some of you are terrified of that because I've suckered you into some crazy things before, but this is serious. I want you to repeat after me. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. And if you can make that your motto, put that somewhere where you'll think about it regularly, where you'll say it out loud to yourself regularly, you'll be on your way to understanding what a relationship to God looks like and how growing in that relationship to God, this is the dynamic that makes it work. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. And like John, everything is just pointing forward to Jesus. Every conversation, every opportunity is to point to Jesus, to give testimony to Jesus, to tell a Jesus story when you have opportunity to tell a story. It's all about Jesus. This message of salvation is so simple. John said it, uh, and Jesus used a lot of the same verbiage when he started his preaching ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, turn from your sin, all of sin, and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we, we need to acknowledge our sin to God. He already knows it, but he wants to hear us real, say it to him. And not just that we know we've sinned, but we want to turn away from that, and we want to follow his agenda. We want to get on his plan. We put all our faith in Jesus Christ as the one and only hope. Jesus who died on the cross and was raised from the dead, our only way to find forgiveness of sin, to establish a relationship to God, and to know that one of these days we're going to be with him forever in eternity. Now, I am, John's the first Baptist preacher, we'll say. I'm not the first Baptist preacher. John, certainly the first. And I'm probably not going to be the last Baptist preacher, but I'll tell you this. I may be the last Baptist preacher you ever hear from who gives you the opportunity, invites you to give your life to Christ. And today's a good day to say yes. And why would you want to wait to settle forever? Eternity and life, forgiveness, it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. And it's not about you. Let's yield some things, give over some things to the Savior today.